and COVID restrictions. What should the government do or not do as we approach the autumn and winter m months? You've heard our views on the subject, but as always, there's two sides to an argument. So for today's head-to-head, -head, we're asking whether or not vaccine passports should be introduced, whether the Coronavirus Act should be repealed and whether we will see the return of lockdowns. Yes, well, on one side of the argument, we have Alan Miller, co-founder of the hashtag Open for All and hashtag Together campaigns. They've gained national traction and are strongly anti-vaccine passports and anti-lockdown. On the other side is Dr Chris Smith, founder of The Naked Scientist, who will give us an alternative view. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. As you all know by now, you get 60 seconds to state your case. So, Alan, we're going to start with you, if that's OK. Should we or should we not have vaccine passports? Absolutely not should we have vaccine passports. We should have no show-me-your-health papers to participate in normal society. Uh, what we do with our bodies are entirely our own business. They're unscientific. You can be uh, vaccinated and transmit. You can not have the vaccination and have immunity. So it's a pantomime. It's draconian. It puts all sorts of logistical problems on venues. Security guards have to ask you. And in a free society, we should never have to produce health papers to enter. Well, there we go. You had, lo you had loads of time well, left half, there. Was half a minute left. <laughs> so quick, you'd rattled through it. But uh, all right, we'll flip, flick over then. Uh, Dr Chris, it's your turn now. 60 seconds. What's your views on the vaccine passports? Well, I know this is a head-to-head, -head, but they also say great minds think alike. And, and I agree completely with what Alan is saying. Uh, I, I think this is a, a good move that the government have decided to backtrack on introduction of vaccine passports. I've actually been saying for a long time this is not an effective measure and it's not effective for a number of reasons. Chiefly that you have a situation where these vaccines, while they're extremely good at preventing people from becoming severely unwell, they don't stop all cases of infection and therefore there is a risk you could end up with people becoming falsely reassured and you use this as the gatekeeper to get into a venue and as a result, you could then end up with more transmissions as a result. And it's extremely inflexible. It's difficult. And I think it puts a lot of responsibility on some sectors of the hospitality industry. I think it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And it, it's not where we ought to be going. No, In speaking, some respects, yeah, I'm therefore reassured by right. the fact the government right, have said that right. they Enough. want to, to stop this. There's rules. There's rules. Right. Thank you very much. We're going to flip it over now. And I believe actually have a proper head to head on something, which is about whether or not we might have any more lockdown. So, Chris, I'm going to go back to you on this. Now, do you feel as though we will? Do you feel as though we should? OK, well, the Prime Minister has said that they're not going to be any more lockdowns. I also think if we look at what happened last time, a number of countries have tried these so-called circuit breakers, fire breaks, various interventions that were short term. The time that they set for those interventions was a week or so. Now, we've got a disease here that has an incubation period of up to 14 days. So any amount of time that's less than that and significantly less than that, like seven days, means that there will be significant numbers of people still incubating the infection and therefore going to manifest it and going to pass it on beyond the time scale of those so-called fire breaks. So this is not an effective intervention. And what we should do is to get much more confidence behind how good the vaccines are, how well they're performing, and the fact that they are stopping enormous numbers of cases going into hospital and becoming severely unwell. We should promote and prioritise vaccination, get the data around boosting, because boosters may or may not be required for certain sectors of society. We're waiting on clarification on that this week. Once we've got that, we'll know where we stand, and then we should have a plan for winter which puts that at the heart of it. Uh, OK, and uh, Alan, let me ask you, what do you think about sort of booster jabs for everybody? Is that the, the strategy government should be moving to now? Well, firstly, I would say that lockdowns are, are actually a terrible policy. They are not sci based on science. They're based on a particular outlook that has never been done before. Uh, it threw away the whole pandemic strategy and has terrible collateral damages. Uh, in health, we now see up to 14 million people waiting for the NHS for all sorts of treatment. In terms of education, families, jobs, mental health, a range of areas, the collateral damages are colossal. There's never been a proper risk-benefit analysis because it was so new and it was implemented and it's very problematic and we should never implement a policy like that again unless you have something like Ebola which or the Black Death, which this patently was not. This is very terrible uh, for many, particularly vulnerable and elderly. 
Uh, and, and we saw the consequences of that. But the decision of lockdown across all societies is very problematic. In terms of boosters and vaccines, you know, let's just say I've had my vaccine. I took my mum to have hers. I think it's very beneficial for people who are vulnerable and particularly older. But then we've seen this discussion that it should be increasingly younger people, 12 to 15 year olds ignoring JCVI advice and then talking about as young as almost six months. And you think, where is this going? And then you have a conversation about boosters. Now, if you're in a vulnerable category, I can definitely see the virtue and the merit in it. But this discussion about constant boosters for something that, frankly, many people have had now. And if you're younger and you've had it and you have immunity, you have much more immunity uh, rather than having the actual vaccination. I do not think that uh, an obsession about um, boosters should be the call of the day. And actually, the word obsession is important. We need to calmly and rationally evaluate the risks versus the uh, benefits and rewards of all things. I'm very concerned that the government, when it's considering these things, like with instance JCV, JCVI advice, is not doing that. All right, OK, OK. Dr Chris, we'll throw back to you. Just respond to that, please. Uh, well, I think that really getting our confidence back is critical here. It's going to take a little while, but people seeing that these vaccines do work will get data and clarification around who needs a booster and more critically, who doesn't. And that's anticipated very, very quickly. We can then ideally time the administration of these boosters to protect the most vulnerable and leave other people who don't need those boosters to the immunity that they now inevitably have, because the vaccines are really good. They will have worked much better, actually, than your average flu vaccine that, that, that protects people very effectively in a flu season. So we're in a position now where, thanks to vaccination, we've converted what would be a lethal infection for some people into a trivial infection for almost all people. And that's part and parcel of going forward now. We'll be living alongside coronavirus, not trying to stop it, because we all accept that this is not going to go away. It's not something we can eradicate. It will be with us for the foreseeable future. So treating it the same way we manage the flu on a seasonal basis is probably the best mindset for us to adopt.